I invite your attention this morning to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. We're going to be in verse 42 this morning through verse 50. Uh, and as you're turning there, I want you to know that uh, we have all place for the sermons for next year. Darren, when are we going to be done with Mark? Thanksgiving weekend 2019. Amen. And uh, if you're alive, if the Lord doesn't come back and you're alive, then you will have a party with me. But I pray it's been a blessing to you. And I just want to let you know, next week is our last nine marks of a healthy church. Uh, Brother Steve Braden will be talking through the healthiness of deacons to the church next week. And after that, we're smooth sailing all the way through for several months. So uh, pray for Steve as he brings the word next week as well. Well, I love uh, Sunday school time because especially with kids, you get in a lot of fun conversations with kids. And there was a story of a Sunday school teacher telling the story of the rich man and Lazarus. You may re recall this uh, from Luke chapter 16. And she said that Lazarus sat outside the rich man's gate, but he was covered with sores and he begged for food. And she also shared through the Bible that the rich man passed and Lazarus wasn't even seen the whole time. But when they both died, Lazarus went to heaven, the parable says, and while the rich man found himself in hell. And the teacher described that very graphically. And when she finished, she said, now which children would you rather be, the rich man or Lazarus? And there was that pregnant pause. You know, it happens in every class where you think people are thinking, but you don't know if you should jump in. And one little fellow said, teacher, I would like to be the rich man on, in this life until I die. And afterwards, I want to be like Lazarus. Amen. <laughs> Don't you get kids? They get the, both sides of that coin very, very well. But I will tell you in a serious vein that the, the truth that's needed in this hour is the truth that Lazarus saw in that parable and the truth that we're going to look at today, and it is called repentance. Because no truth has been more neglected, watered down, marginalized, or silenced in these days. But repentance was the very first message of John the Baptist. He said, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus, in Mark 1, we looked at this a year and a half ago. He said, repent and believe in the gospel. And the book of Acts, the first message of the new era after Jesus' resurrection, Peter's sermon, repent. What must I do, they said? He said, repent. And that was the ongoing message of the early church was to repent. Jesus said to the seven churches, I'm coming to remove your lampstand unless you repent. And so it's radical and divisive. It really is. But repentance is turning away from sin and turning to God. And you see sin for what it is. It includes a genuine heart that you see your sin and you are sorry for what you've done before a holy, holy God. And it's a change of mind and heart and of the will. And here in Mark 9, Jesus is going to teach them a message of repentance. And for us today, we're going to look at this and say, wow, this is very radical. And it is. Because they're not in danger of going to hell, these disciples. They are in danger of doing things that show forth that they have not still yet got the gospel. No one can be saved without repentance, and no one can be sanctified without repentance. What about Psalm 7, which says this? It says, if a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. Whoa. But I thought Jesus loved me. Amen, he does, right? But there is repentance. And these are some of the most shocking words, the most sobering words that came from our Lord. And we want the full impact of these words to sink into us. Because Jesus is going to explain to his disciples that they are men, and they are going to go everywhere and call people to repent. But before they can call people to repent, they may need to repent of some things themselves. And they will need to embrace this themselves. But also in these verses, Jesus is going to speak of the reality of hell. You know what your mom told you, H-E double hockey sticks or something like that? He, Jesus had more to say about hell than he did about heaven. He had more about hell than any other person in the Bible. And we're going to take a couple weeks to go through these verses, but what I want to tell you is that hell's a real place for real people with a real fire, with a real torment forever. And to believe in heaven and not hell is to say that there are times when Jesus told the truth and there are times when Jesus really just lied through his teeth. 
And to refuse what Jesus says about hell is to refuse the cross upon which Jesus died to save sinners such as us from hell. These verses will speak to the absolute necessity of repentance in the disciples' lives. Your lives, my life, our church's life. And the message is clear. Better for you to cut off your hands, your feet, your eyes, to put away your sin than to go your, to hell. Whatever you do, Jesus will say, don't go to hell. Pluck out your eyes, be blind, be crippled, do anything, but don't be, and I'm using this word in its proper sense, do not be damned to hell. If you sin, Jesus said, you're going to hell forever unless you repent. This is what Jesus said to his disciples, to tighten the bolt inside their thinking so they wouldn't be loose about their eternal destinies. It's a true statement and a theological fact they must embrace. But why do we hear so little preaching about this today? I mean, honestly, when is the last time? I I think I've asked this in previous years, but has anyone ever heard a sermon just on hell? Just out of curiosity couple hands, three, four, maybe five. So guys, why is it that we spend so little time talking about this, that this is what the Bible says? Those are questions we're going to answer. But I want you to see the big idea today is we cannot truly believe in the radical claims of Christ without it having a drastic, uh, an awesome effect on us to some way, shape, or form so that we are devastated to the fact that we change our lives. Every Christian should be conservative, theologically, and radical for Christ. Conservative in preserving the faith and radical in applying it. And before we forget, some of those radical things you can do is just simply singing, Jesus loves me with your grandkids or your kids. Because that alone is something that moms and dads and grandkids, grandparents do because that is what we believe is true. But the gospel of Jesus is radical. It's humbling radically, it's radically hopeful, and it will radically change everything in your life. So let's look at three radical demands today from what Jesus says. He's going to show us radical love, verse 42, radical purity, and radical obedience. And this is on the heels, if you recall, where Jesus has been talking to them about who's the greatest, who's going to serve me, who are in the kingdom of God. And last week we saw that if someone professes Christ and preaches Christ, then leave them alone if they are walking with Christ. Be honest with you. If you've been on Facebook, you've seen a couple polls I put out on my Facebook group about these things, and it has been amazing the comments that have come back with professing Christians who deny the very things that we are going to be talking about today. Scary. More ways than one. Will you join me as we stand in honor of God's words, if you're able this morning, as we read Mark 9, 42 through verse 50. Before we get started, let me just tell you, some of you may have verses 44, some of you may not have verse 44. Some of you may have verse 46, some of you may not have verse 46. I want to tell you that the best translations I believe that we have include verses 44 and 46, but those verses are the same as verse 48. And we'll get there, we'll talk about it. But if I read a verse and it, it's not there for you, please trust that that is God's word as we have it. So here it is, verses 42 through 50. Hear God's word this morning. Whoever, Jesus speaking, causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than to go with two hands to hell to the unquenchable fire. Where their worm does not die, verse 44, and the fire is not quenched, verse 44, verse 45. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than have two feet thrown into hell. Verse 46, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Verse 47, if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes thrown into hell. Where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt loses its saltiness, how will it make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with everyone. I will admit to you as your pastor, I wanted to say, will someone exchange this morning with me? Because this is a tough passage. It really is. And I pray that we do so with grace. I pray we do so with humility. 
but also the seriousness by which our Lord takes it, because this really is a very tough passage, but it's one we need to hear as the disciples did. We pray with me this morning. Father, as we come before you, we thank you that your word is true. We thank you, Lord, that it is God-breathed. It is not it is not man inventing it, but men, as Peter says, as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit, wrote as you wrote through them, through their personalities, uniquely as they were, through their temperaments, but all together one unifying message, that we are the chief of sinners, but you are the chief of chiefs, the Lord of lords, and that in Christ, by faith, through grace, and your Son alone, we can be saved. Father, thank you for that message. Thank you that on a rainy day in October, Father, with all the things that may be going on in our lives, that you remind us that we are so loved in you that no one could ever love us more. And you can love us no less because of your faithfulness. We are as close to you as your son is, Father, to you in union with you. Thank you so much. Give us great wisdom as we talk through a very serious part of your word. All of your word is serious, especially this moment for this time. We pray this in Jesus' name. God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Well, as I say this, I mentioned a minute ago, we're actually going to look at two things. We're gonna get, we should get through our verses today. I want to correct that. But I want to say that in a couple weeks, Lord willing, we're going to be looking at 15 realities about hell. And uh, the Chiefs game's at 3 o'clock that day, so you'll be all right. Uh, it'll be just fine. But I want you to know that in two weeks, we're going to be looking at 15 realities about hell. What does the Bible say? Because I don't want you walking out of here, especially in this Halloween season, with that pitchfork devil thing where, like, this guy pitchforks you all. That's, that's, that's Hollywood. That's not Bible. But the Bible speaks very seriously about a literal, conscious, eternal place we believe is called hell. We'll get there in a couple weeks and a little bit today. First, though, I want you to see the radical love of Jesus. Notice what he says here. He says, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe. Is Jesus talking about little kids? No, he's, he's talking about believers here. He's talking about little believers, those in the faith who we may cause through our sin to fall away from walking with Jesus Christ. It's something that, that, that does that, an ungodly life. Something they see in you that you do that you say on Sunday you won't do, but you, during the week you do. And one person here is causing another to stumble into sin. And we all influence one another, whether for good or bad, don't we? That's why we always need to think through, especially those on social media, before you hit that post button, how will this encourage or discourage others about my faith in Jesus Christ? The test. And the extra influence that it causes us to hear. But he says the word stumble. You may have that in verse 42. It literally, in the, in the English, it means a scandal. To entice, to ensnare, to entrap, to influence another person in such a way that it causes them to sin. You cause a sin, and they fall into sin. And he says it's better for him, that person who causes the sin in another person, to go with a heavy millstone to be cast into the sea. Now, I'm not a farmer. I grew up in a farming community. There are probably more cows than people in the city. But one thing I know is you know what a millstone is, right? A millstone is what they used to use when a donkey or an animal would walk around in a circle. You know, pr picture that animal. You're not going to eat it for lunch yet. That's in an hour. You'll get there. But it keeps walking around, and it's crushing up the grain. It's a big old stone. Think Fred Flintstone stone and, like, double-size that. And then it didn't, it didn't roll like the old Flintstone thing. And, th and Jesus is saying, you have to have such radical love for other people that you need to be so careful with your life that you don't cause someone else in the church to fall away because you have sinned. What a weighty expectation. He's literally saying sometimes it's better to be cast into the bottom of the ocean than into the depths of hell itself if you cause another to sin. Matthew 18, 7, he said in a similar passage, Jesus, woe to the world for temptations for sin. For it's necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. You know, and, and Tori will put this up, but one of the surest signs of growth and grace for you in your walk is that you grieve and you repair when possible the impact your sin has on other people. I say when possible. Because there are times in your life when you sin and you're radically trying to live for Jesus that, that they may not be repairable because it... Someone passes away, or they move away, or they won't talk to you. 
But I pray that we hate our sins more than we hate the sins of others who sin differently than us. I pray that we refuse to let us be more, I pray though that we were, uh, we're more bothered by our sin than our suffering. Because Jesus says to radically love other people, it requires that we think about the things that we do. You know, you can get in, I'll just speak, this is off topic for a moment, you can get into the debate, you know, should Christians have tattoos, should Christians drink alcohol, should Christians smoke, should, you're like, chase those rabbits faster, come on now, should Christians dance, all those things, play cards or go with people that do. But one thing I'll say is that where there may be liberty, perhaps, in a very limited way in some of those areas, does the way you conduct your life cause other believers to sin by the way they see you profess your faith and live it out? in some other way. Let us be more bothered by our sin than our suffering. Jesus protects his people and expects us to treat believers like we would like to be treated. We should look for out for others and not entice them to sin by direct temptation. Consider others, Philippians 2, better than yourself. We should not provoke our children. I, as, a, as a father, I'm learning this more and more, how easy it is to provoke our children to anger by just being me, and, and, and not being the godly husband and father sometimes I need to be. I'm sure you've been there. We should not set a bad example, Romans 14, or even fail to stimulate others to love and good deeds. Pray for this. Because, guys, as we get ready to go into the next point, Jesus is going to say that as we come together, it is radical love when you consider that sometimes you may have to take a step back from doing whatever it is you like to do because that may offend another believer and cause them to sin. Oh, pastor, you're getting legalistic. Didn't you preach last week that you shouldn't be narrower than the truth, legalism, or wider than the truth, liberalism? No, it's not what we're saying. But have you considered how you handle yourself as a Christian? Do you go on social media to pick on that bone again and post all this inflammatory stuff and then put a picture about Jesus and life is good? That happens more than we know, doesn't it? Or do you believe, and this may cause others to stumble, do you believe that God provides all your needs, but you put up that post that says, man, if you don't like this post, God ain't going to bless you. That's hogwash is what it is. God blesses you as he blesses you. But may we walk so radically in our love for one another that we don't cause others to stumble. But if we do, may we seek to repair to the best of our ability by God's grace and his spirit that relationship. But the big one, are you ready for this? Go and let's see the second radical claim that Jesus talks about, radical purity. Look back at verse 43. This is where the rubber really meets the road. Jesus says, you want some specifics? I'm going to give you some about your hands, give you some about your feet, and some about your eyes. Look at verse 43. And Jesus says, on the heels of the radical love, he says, and if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Oh, boy. What's he saying here? Is he literally saying that we should have a chopping block inside and bring the sharpest object you got and just go to town? Is that what he is saying? Well, verse 42 says you cause someone else to stumble. It's better that you cast a big millstone, a big rock around you. But the, the hand is the thing a person does. It's a figure of speech. You know, you put your hand to the plow, right? You put your shoulder, what, into it. What he's saying speaking figuratively, is that if there is something in your life that is so demanding of your attention and it starts with your hands, stop it. It's kind of like when a surgeon, and I, I'm a history buff, uh, Patricia, I don't know if she's here today, but we were at our members meeting yesterday, and Patricia Wood said, you know, I love history, I love learning about history, I'm that same way. You know back in the Civil War days, there were times when losing, amputating a leg or an arm or a hand would save the person and their whole body would be saved, but it meant they lost the limb. What would the person do? The doctor would make a choice right there, wouldn't he? He would just go, <laughs> and their life would be saved. And what Jesus says is it's better to enter to the life. Look at that. He says it's better, in verse 43, to enter into the life crippled than with two hands and go to hell to the unquenchable fire. Your Bible may say, and I think it's the correct translation, the life. The life refers to the kingdom of life, but it's better to give up what's most precious to you than to hang on to what is precious to you in sin. 
And as you nurture other people, there can be ideas of this little pet sin. But sin can never be pigeonholed. It, sp- it spreads like cancer to the entire soul. And according to this verse, how many sins does it take for us to go to hell? A hundred? Fifty? No. It takes one sin, does it not? Your hand causes you to sin, then you're guilty enough for unquenchable fire. Adam had to sin how many times, church, before all oblivion broke out? One time. James 2.10 says, whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point is guilty of it all. Because the Old Testament's not a series of miscategorized things. It's one law, and it's like hitting a glass with a sledgehammer. I, I've always wanted to be on a demolition crew and do those things, you know, take a sledgehammer. And if you hit it in the corner, is the corner just going to fall off? No. The whole thing is going to come shattering down, is it not? <coughs> Excuse me. Not only will one sin be enough for us to go to hell, but it's sufficient to go to hell forever. And notice what it says here. Jesus is not mincing words. He calls hell unending. Did you notice that? Verse 43, he says it is to hell to the unquenchable fire. Well, Darren, I thought hell was just like you go there for a couple years and then you just cease to exist. That is not biblical theology. If hell ceases to exist after two years, then heaven ought to cease to exist after two years. Revelation 14, 11, and the smoke of their torment will go up forever and ever, and there is no rest day or night for those who worship the beast. Revelation 19, 3, and a second time they said, hallelujah, for smoke ascends forever and ever. Revelation 20, 10, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever and ever. It's sobering. It really is. We won't learn this from the world, but only from the Word of God. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off, then go to the fiery hell. Friends, this speaks very much, doesn't it? If there is a sin in your life that is causing you not to walk with Christ, cut it off. Cut it off. Cut it off. And that is the price of eternal happiness. It is short-term, sin-killing, love-pursuing pain. That is what sin does. That is what sin does. And you will notice there, again, it's not speaking of a literal cutoff, although there were times in history, if you know your history, there were times where people would maim themselves in order not to sin, but that's not the problem. The sin is in your mind. It starts in here, and you can't take your brain out and still live, right? doesn't quite work. Now, you may feel like that at days. Your brain's not with you. That's a whole other topic. That's called old age, but, 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 but this is not what that's referring to. That's what he says. Now, look back at verse 45. Again, it, your Bible may not have verse 44. I just want to tell you the best manuscripts for my research has verse 44, which is the same as verse 48, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. But he not only talks about the hand, he goes to the foot. And if your foot, verse 45, causes you to sin, it is better for you to cut it off than to enter life lame than with two feet and be thrown into hell. Man, such things. Again, not literally. There were those in the early church who did that. But can I just speak frankly for a second? Whatever sin is in your life that is causing you not to walk in the glory of Christ and all he has for you, whatever lure that is casting you to fall into sin, you need to play hard ball with that sin. And let me just speak very clearly here. I believe there is a a place for counseling, but you don't need to go to 14 counselors that told you you had a hard time with your mom and pamper you in that sin. You need to repent and take it to Jesus Christ. Sin is a monstrous rebellion against the holy God, and God is high and lifted up. Tina led us in that song, and sin is much of a blight and a blemish upon the human soul. And don't think we can just get in these little groups and talk about our foot problems and, oh, woe is me, and oh, woe. Cut it off. It is a command. It means do it. It's present tense. You're always going to face it this side of heaven. And it's middle voice. You go do it. Are you lured into porn? Cut it off. Are you fighting with your wife? Then speak graciously to her. 
Are you doing things at your work that you know you shouldn't be doing? Then stop it. Then stop it. Because it's better to enter, notice that phrase again, verse 45, the life. It's better to enter heaven again than to have two feet cast into hell. Wow. If you're taking a vote after service, I may not make it past the next Sunday. So, Steve, you might be pastoring sooner than you think. But you know this is what it is. Grace covers all of it, folks, but divine discipline pulls back the covers. And in verse 46, you see that same repetition where he says the wor- that's where the worm goes and it never dies. In verse 47, the hand, the foot, and now the eye. 1 John 2.16, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the boastful pride of life. Jesus doesn't say in verse 47, get some new glasses. He doesn't say get LASIK surgery. He doesn't say close your eyes. What does he say in verse 47? Gouge it out. Take it out. Get rid of it. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. But I thought Jesus loved me where I am. Praise God, he loved you. He does love you, amen? Amen. But praise God, like a good friend, he always speaks the truth to us. He says, gouge it out because it's better to enter the kingdom of God. And those on the outside must enter the narrow gate. But when you as Christians, I as a Christian, enter the narrow gate, we must cast aside the sin as we walk with this. Repent. Isn't this what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 27? Listen, as he says in the Sermon on the Mount, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone looks at a woman with lustful intent, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Matthew 5, 29, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it's better for you to lose one of the members of your body than your whole body causes you to sin. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. It's better to lose one of your members than your whole body in hell. You know, we so often think, don't we, that nobody saw what just happened. Nobody saw that sin or that, that, that thing that we did, but, but Proverbs 15.3 says that the eyes of the Lord go to and fro in the earth, and they uh, do, looking over the good and the bad. And when Jesus sees us, he knows that we may be saved by grace, but he also knows we are still in a cesspool of sin. And it begins with the eyes being stimulated, and whether an act is committed, that doesn't matter. He says to tear it out, to get rid of it. John Flavel, one of those old dead guys, said, Brothers, it's easier to declaim against a thousand sins of others than to fight one sin in ourselves. Isn't that true? It's easier to point the finger and say, You know, if they just did this, or if he stopped doing that, and I wish I could mortify my sins simply by crossing my fingers and saying, Oh, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. But it requires more than that. It requires more than that. Friend, have you spent time with God this week dealing with your soul? Let me be again clear. We are not preaching that you can lose your salvation when you are in Christ. (laughs) Praise God, you are in Christ. Amen. But what we are calling for here is a radical purity of our lives to such a degree that we are separated out from the world and how the world does business. And then he goes to verse 48. Did you notice this? He says in verse 48, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. I'm going to ask you if you'll hold your spot there in Mark, and we're just going to backtrack a little bit to the book of Isaiah. I don't ask you often to turn, but will you go to Isaiah 66 for just one, just a couple moments here? I want you to see where Jesus is quoting this. I want you to see where Jesus is getting this idea from. Uh, and we'll look more at this in a couple weeks, but just for framing this, And we're going to look at the very last verse of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 66 and verse 24. Turn there in your tablet. Swipe there on your phone. Turn there in your pages. Just get there. That's all that matters. Isaiah 66, 24 says this. It says, And they shall go out and look on the dead bodies for the men who have rebelled against me. For their their worm shall not die and their fire shall not be quenched, and they shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. Jesus at the very end of his prophecy, or or, or Isaiah at the very end of his prophecy is being quoted here by Jesus. What does it mean? It means that even in the Old Testament, that there is a place of unspeakable torment, unspeakable pain, 
unspeakable everything where even these people who denied God in that day were going to go. And there are several more from Second Chronicles, from Jeremiah, uh, etc. But hell is a real place. It is a real place with a real geographical location. And as such, it deserves real consideration. Why don't you flip back over to Mark chapter 9. So Jesus talks 12 times, or 11 times, excuse me, in the New Testament about hell. Jesus talks 11 of those 12 times. And some of the things that people say, well, well, he must be speaking symbolically here. You know, if he's speaking symbolically about the eye and the foot and the hand, surely, Pastor, he's speaking symbolically about hell. I don't think so. I don't think there's anything in this context that suggests that. In the Greek, you can see a hyperbole coming with the, uh, the eye and the foot and the hand. But here, Jesus is reminding us that hell is a real place, that, that, that the, it, it, it's, it, it's a fiery place. Matthew 5, 18, it's eternal fire. Matthew 25, it's punishment of eternal fire. Jude 7, it's unquenchable fire. Revelation 20, it's a smoke of great fire. Revelation 9. And the chief image of all the Bible is not some symbolic hell. It is a literal place. A literal place. Just as I'm knocking on this pulpit today, a literal place. Because, folks, think of this logic. Why would God give any people who reject his name, who have been told about his name, any reason to be snuffed out, annihilated, as some believe? It makes no sense. He should do the same to us in heaven. We don't deserve heaven. We deserve the opposite, don't we? Why wouldn't he just snuff us out of heaven? But it's a place, it says, of weeping and gnashing of teeth, Matthew 8. It's torment in the present tense, Luke 16. And 2 Peter 2, it's a pit of darkness. Matthew 25, it's eternal punishment. Matthew 8, it's outer darkness. Hell is a real place where every unbeliever is put into the eternal fire. It's crazy, isn't it? Crazy, because from our human standpoint, we think, God, what are you up to? What are you doing? But all the roads that lead to hell are one-way streets. There's no escape. There's no way out. The exit is not found. These cool 1962 exit signs we have, and I love these things. They don't have those in hell. There's nothing there. The doors are locked from the outside, and once you're inside, it's unceasing torment forever and ever and ever. And it's, it's, it's an abiding place. It's not a resting place. You often hear people say, well, yeah, when I get down to hell, we're going to party there with my friends, and we're just going to live it up. No, you won't. It's full of hard hearts and not one soft heart. Everything in hell is bad, even the gospel, because every time they think about the gospel, they're going to think about times that God brought them someone, a gospel tract, a verbal conversation, a Facebook ad, a Bible verse, and they're going to be so mad at God. How could you do this to me? But God will look at them and say, I gave you every possibility, and you just stood there and did nothing with it. We don't have time to lay it all out. We'll do that in a couple weeks. But the holiness of God necessitates a place called hell. Everything in the being of God rises and revolts against sin, and there's a place to be called hell because God has sent those without him there. The eternality of God demands that it lasts forever. If God is eternal, then the place of punishment must be eternal as well. The non-changingness, the immutability of God demands that there would be never a place of escape or relief. And even the love of God demands that there is a literal hell because God has done for us in Christ. And to reject that is to reject the greatest love that God has ever shown you. It's the greatest terror of all. is isn't simply there's no escape, but once you're in, you're locked up. And you're locked up with the wrath of the Lord of heaven. Well, there in hell is just separation from God. Not true at all. Guys, is there a place where God is not? He's omnipresent. He is everywhere, right? So those in hell can only wish that were the case. That would be relief if God were not in hell, I- inflicting his wrath forever and ever. That would be relief. That would be like when you're out in the hot sun someday in a very human standpoint, and you find some shade, and you're like, oh, that's not what's happening here. Jesus is omnipresent. Revelation 14.10, if anyone worships the beast in his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will drink of the wine of the wrath of God and the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and brimstone, hear this, in the presence of the holy angels and, hear this again, 
the presence of the Lamb. Hell is not separation from God. Hell is included within God's plans, and it is a full place of wrath. And we need to realize that. Friends, Jesus' message is very, very clear. Whatever you do, don't go to hell. Do anything but this. Cut off your hand, be maimed, be crippled, but anything else in the biblical sense, I'm going to use the word again, but don't be damned. If you sin just once and it causes you to go, it's not hard to understand. And, th- and, and, and Tori will put this up, but we have so elevated the love of God beyond His holiness and the wrath that we have air-conditioned hell here in America today. And that doesn't need Linux, Maytag, or anything else you can bring along with you. We really have. Does God love? Amen, doesn't He? God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. But may we not take anything the Bible doesn't take. It's not hard to understand. It, it, I'll be honest with you. It's hard, humanly speaking, to accept, isn't it? I think we're honest. Hell, the real place that it is. But we need to repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Friends, the great truth of Scripture is simply that everything that we have reminds us that we need it. We need to be reminded of these things. Lastly, and I'll close with this, there is radical love. We are to live differently in how we treat others. There's radical purity. How we live our lives should be distinct. And finally, radical obedience. Look at verses 49 and 50. And Nelson and I had this little talk on Thursday about these verses. These are tough. Look at verse 49. And i got to get back there as well. I asked you to turn. I didn't turn myself. For everyone will be salted with fire. For salt is good, but if the salt loses its saltiness or has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. What, Jesus? What are you saying here? This is a tough one. I'll be honest with you. But Jesus is picking up in verse 49. He's telling us we have to have radical obedience. Radical obedience to follow all the stuff to our ears that was crazy to follow. And he says, he's carrying on that word fire in verse 48 from Isaiah 66. And he affirms that everyone will be salted with fire. Whoa, 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 whoa. So, Pastor, are you saying that everyone's going to go to H-E double hockey sticks? Is that what you're saying? No, 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 no. That's, that's not good biblical stuff. So what does this mean? Everyone. Who's the everyone? Is it believers? Is it unbelievers? Is it both? The answer is C, it's both. Unbelievers will be salted with fire, literal fire. We'll get there in a couple weeks. But but for the unbelievers, it's preserving fire as a final judgment in hell. But for the disciple, for the Christian, it'll be preserving and refining fires of trials and suffering that we go through as we follow these commands of obedience that Christ has given us. You ever try to live a holy life? You're doing that every day, most of you all, right? It's hard, isn't it? tiring it's it's burdensome it's overwhelming at times to try and live for jesus as we're called to live for jesus but it must have a significant place in our lives because this is what he says so okay pastor how do we get radical obedience look at verse 50 how do we get there verse 50 summarizes this by stating that salt is good as long as it has its saltiness jesus you just commended (coughs) excuse me you just commended those to hell unbelievers forever, but then you go talk about have salt in yourselves. What? What What does this mean? What it means is that salt loses its purifying and preserving value, then it's worthless and has nothing. He says, therefore, have salt. It's a command in yourselves. Sinclair Ferguson, if you need a good person to listen to, Sinclair Ferguson helps clarify this. He says, quote, I want you to hear this clearly. He says, Our Lord's point is that unless we maintain the purity of our own lives, plucking out the eye, cutting off the hand, cutting off the foot, and are purified by the flames of testing and remain faithful to Christ, our lives will have no preserving influence on this corrupt world. Let me read that one more time. Our Lord's point is that unless we maintain the purity of our own lives and are purified by the flames of testing and remain faithful to Christ, Our lives will have no preserving influence on this corrupt world. You want to win people to Jesus Christ? It starts 
in part at least, by living such a different life. When the world looks at you and your testimony, they can only say, why are you so different? And obviously, good Bible study says that we have to open our mouth because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We have to verbally share the gospel. But in light of the disciples' argument, you remember back in verse 34, they said, well, I'm the greatest and I'm the greatest. And, and John's opposition, Jesus tells them, be at peace with one another. Encourage one another in these truths. Live out your life to the glory of God in such a way that when they look at you, when you are telling them they're headed for hell, they can do nothing against your character. They may hate your message. They may hate the one you're a messenger of, but they can never look at your life and say, well, you're just like me. Why should I listen to you? Disciples are the salt of the earth. And you'll see this on the screen. We are not the sugar, baby. And I mean that. We are to bring stinging conviction by God's word to the raw wounds of this world, but we are not to sweeten them. This is why churches who try and entertain goats are doing just that. They're entertaining goats. This is why church is not primarily built for unbelievers. Every unbeliever, you're watching this on Facebook or whatever, every unbeliever is always welcome here, but the church, Christian, is for you. It's for you. You need to be reminded of these things. I need to be reminded of these things. So what do we do with this? Be humble. Avoid causing others to stumble or, or to cause them to sin. Don't fuss or fight to get your way in the church if it means that you're causing someone else to sin. Be at peace with one another. If you're gossiping about someone in this church, stop it right now. Go to that person and repent and seek them out. Do whatever it takes to be at peace with one another because there is a coming judgment day and we will be held in account. Be a witness and reflection of all that God has. Put, pull for other brothers and sisters, not against them. Don't try and fight for position. Well, it, well, the pastor sees it this way, but if we just do it this way, we're going to see people come to Christ. That may well be true. Probably more than I admit. But it's the way that we do it, the way that I do it, honoring to Christ. After all, we may play different positions, but we are on the same team. Amen? We follow our Lord, and He tells us, live a radical life of love, of purity, and obedience to separate you from the world. Not legalistically, don't be narrower than the truth. Last week, don't be wider than the truth. Follow me, and you're going to be okay. Will you pray with me as we close out today? Father, thank you so much for the simple reminder from these verses. They are tough. And I know even standing up here and preaching through them and studying through them this week, they, they really just, there's no wiggle room here. It is, it is what it is. But, Father, that is life with you. Lord, that, that you tell us there is one way to heaven. There's a one way to live a holy life. It's, it's following your commands, not the traditions of men as we've studied and marked before. Father, I pray that our church, especially is a place where people feel welcome, but we don't welcome sin. We don't welcome complacency with, with holiness. We don't welcome anything that would be contra or different or, 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 or just railing against what we just heard. Father, I pray we're a church that preaches boldly. Father, that we put salt in the wounds, but at the same time we remind people that you so loved the world, and you did. You loved us. We're beloved in Christ. We are, we are lavished. Uh, uh, Father, we're seated with you in the heavenlies, Ephesians says. Yet, Lord, at the same time, we need to be reminded of this. This isn't going to make the 9 o'clock news. It's not going to make uh, Fox or CNN. It, it may never even be heard about how we try to live for you. But by your Spirit, would you continue to give us grace to live out the holy, narrow life that is the Christian life? Father, we're going to stumble. We're going to cause others to stumble. But thank you that your grace is wide. Not so wide that everyone who just gets to heaven, we all go to heaven but, Lord, it's why that forgiveness has been given to us at the cross, and we are to forgive seven times 70. And we are to be at peace with all men, as Romans says, so long as it depends on us. But, Lord, to your glory, may we live radical lives, not to be radical, but because you called us to a different way of living. Father, I pray that starts from the pastor's chair all the way down, and together as families, as grandparents, as singles, as married, as widow and widowers, as teenagers, whatever we are, children here, that you grow us in Christ. 
Father, we love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name and God's people said, amen. Amen. I ask you to join with us as we